Boop, 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 boop. Okay, what are you guys doing that? Where is my... Okay. All right. Okay. Sorry, guys. I'm a little bit turned around today. Um, hope everybody's had an okay uh, a week. Um, we will talk about Field of Dreams and stuff later, but I wanted to start off with um, something that I've not yet really covered you guys have had some readings about but i wanted to start going over again some of the specific um uh descriptions of what wetlands are so we can finish that up so then we can turn fully to just talking about restorations so um i'm going to show you all a video first a short video that i made this week last week let me just make sure you guys can see all of this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, th I think you guys should be able to, you should be able to um, see this now. Okay. So tell me if you guys cannot Let's just do a quick test right here. Let's talk about hydrology. You, you guys hear that, right? Yep. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah. So this is just a quick short video, and then we'll get into um, talking about um, some of the elements in a sec. Let's talk about hydrology. So again, we have our tripartite definition of, uh, well, one of our definitions of a wetland, federal definitions is a tripartite definition, three-parted. The first part of that, hydrology. As we look down at, at uh, this lobe of the twin ponds here in the Conejo open space area, um, we see that the, the lowest part, the, the most central part of this um, roughly oval pond has water still standing in it. We're recording this um, mid-September. 2020 it's been a relatively it, we got some good rain this past season but it's been dry for many many months so as we look down as we get closer we can see this water is stagnant so it's green um, and so that means it's been there for a while we got a lot of algal blooms probably have a lot of coyote and deer and other other critters pooping in there and all that kind of good stuff leading to these algal blooms um, and while that might look gross to us that's actually fantastic for things like um, red-legged tree frogs and other herps and amphibians and stuff. Um, now, in this case, this place still has water. This part of the wetland still has water. Other parts are dry. Remember that the, the um, typical number of days that we have to have to meet the federal definition is 14 days of standing water. So clearly, this has been, this, this area has had water, again, we're, we're in September and it hasn't rained for months, so this area has had water for well beyond the 14-day minimum. As we look, we see that, that over time, either because of draining or evaporation or evapotranspiration as the plants take up uh, this water, um, the water level has been dropping. And uh, when we get rains, obviously the water level will go up. So wetlands can fluctuate in the amount of, um, uh, of water, the hydrology can change. We can have wetlands that accumulate only rainwater. We can have wetlands that accumulate uh, uh, water, overflowing water from rivers and things of that nature. There's a whole bunch of sources where we can get our water. In some cases, we have um, uh, artisanal, so we have, we have subsurface water that might flow into a wetland at times. In this case, this is just regular rainwater. So hydrology, that's our first part of our definition. The, uh, the next part is gonna be our vegetation. Oh, actually, the next, the next will be our hydric soils. So as we look at these soils here, from you know high above, it's hard to tell. But if we went down there and reached that and, and felt that, we would be able to see that these are, these are so-called hydric soils, meaning soils that have been exposed to water for a long period of time. 
So if we have any, uh, say, iron in here, the iron is not going to look black. It's going to look orange because it'll be just like rust. Um, and and there, there's all kinds of other uh, characteristic uh, signals here um, when we start looking at the soil texture, et cetera. But, but one thing, it tends to be uh, the soil in the, in, underneath this water here, will, the soils will tend to be anoxic. So they'll tend to be relatively reduced. They'll tend to be relatively oxygen poor and have the associated um, uh, microbial and other fungal communities um, associated with that. Now, the, the third part, the last part of our tripartite definition of what makes something a wetland is the vegetation. So if we keep uh, looking here, we, we look uh, beyond, we have the water area right now, then we have the sort of uh, non-inundated uh, non soil, then we have all this vegetation. So as we look around this vegetation, as we go high, so if we look up a little bit higher, um, we'll see more terrestrial vegetation. But as we get really, as we look back down really close to the, the edge, the perimeter of this pond, what we're seeing are things like cattails, typha, uh, the genus typha, um, and other reeds and sedges. So these are wetland um, uh, plants. Now, now our definition is both facultative and obligate plants. Um, facultative plants are plants that can live anywhere in a terrestrial place and also can live in a wetland setting. Obligate wetland vegetation can only live in the wetland. Um, now, if it's a salt marsh obligate, it needs, it, you know, it, it's in salty areas. If it's um, in a place like this, it's a seasonal freshwater uh, vegetation palette, et cetera. What makes something a facultative or an obligate wetland plant? There's a list. There's a list that's produced by the Army Corps of Engineers. And every few years, people like me, nerdy people like me, get together and we, we adjust the list. And we say, oh, this plant is, this plant isn't. So we have an objective list that we can turn to and say, this is or isn't. So again, the three parts of what makes, uh, what defines a wetland as far as um, we typically are concerned in the context of restoration is inundation is water, the hydrology, is uh, uh, saturated soils, uh, soils exposed to water for a long period of time, and then facultative or obligate wetland plants, vegetation. So those three things, the water, the soil, the vegetation makes uh, or, or tells us that this indeed is a wetland and uh, and that's cool. I like wetlands. You like wetlands? Yeah. Yeah, wetlands are cool. Okay. All right. Okay. So um, next, I want to uh, just talk uh, briefly about the abiotic context. To um, and everybody can see this, right? Everybody can see my screen now. We're good. Yep. Okay, cool. So first we're going to talk about um, the abiotic context and then um, the biotic context of our wetlands. So with, with all of these systems we're, we're interested in restoring, um, the first part is, uh, the first thing we're concerned about is the non-living part, the physical, the chemical setting. That's going to define what possible life could live in there. So first we need to understand that. Once we have a, a sense of that, then we can start talking about the critters that might live there and or the critters that might transform the area, ameliorate it, make it easier for other life to come in and, and do their due. So um, we should always start with the, with the abiotic. Uh, historically in the field of restoration, we, um, uh, since it was done, since it, it's, mostly biologists type people that like living things that were so interested in restoration and they were the pushers for trying to fix the trees and fix the critters. They were the first ones in to the restoration world and which is which was fine except that they didn't necessarily have a great grounding in physics and engineering in some of the abiotic systems and so initially we have and when we talk about for example um, we talk about many examples, but the classic one I think around us would be something like um, Malibu Lagoon, <clears throat> which the original restoration was done, the salt marsh restoration was done by biologists, and they screwed it up. They screwed up essentially the physical setting, and it, they made things more problematic than they needed to be. So our most recent restoration, the, the revamp of Malibu Lagoon, um, avoided that. And, and, uh, and biologists were but one of a, a broad team of players in the field of restoration. Okay, so let's talk about the abiotic setting here. Um, again, remember, we 
uh, and remember you guys interrupt me if I'm going too fast or this stuff doesn't make sense or, or what have you. Um, uh, remember before we talked about wetlands as being these not systems, right? They're not purely underwater. They're not purely terrestrial. They're this sort of betwixt between um, system. And so because of that, that's one of the reasons we developed this so-called tripartite definition of a wetland. Um, and, and this definition was really worked up more so by, um, because of legal issues than, than necessarily ecological ones. Um, I'd say most ecologists would be able to go out to a site. Most of you could go out to a site and we look at it and we go, eh, it's probably a wetland, right? And that's generally good enough for us in many, in many contexts. But when we try to have rigorous definitions and are, are strictly trying to compare apples to apples um, and, and have to compare something, say, in Florida to something, say, in California or Alaska to Ohio or something of that nature, we need a, a more rigorous definition that would stand up in a court of law. And that's how we got the, the tripartite definition. So again, three parts, the hydric soils, the, 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 the soils that have been exposed to um, uh, water for a long period of time, change the chemistry, the, the wetland loving plants, and, uh, and the water, how much water is, is at the surface for how much amount of time. So more on those in a, in a quick second. Um, but in general, the, the abiotic setting for wetlands, this, is, this isn't exactly true, but, but as, our, as our first quick and dirty definition, you can think of them as low spots. That doesn't always apply, that doesn't always work, but, but for the most part, um, these wetlands are sort of a, a, a catchment. These wetlands are sort of a bottom of the drain, if you will. And so they're going to capture things. Those things include water. Those things include um, sediments and other compounds. And so character, a characteristic wetland is something at the bottom of a um, watershed uh, or a low point in a watershed, um, which is going to either slow water movement down. So if the water is coming from here and going to there, it's gonna spend, if it weren't for the wetland, it would go fast through the system. But because of the, the wetland system, it's gonna actually act to slow that water movement. It's gonna increase the residence time in this little area. Uh, and in, in fact, it might, it might uh, not only slow movement of water or sediments or other things, it might actually capture them. It might entrain them and, and act as a sink, a local sink for those, those materials. Um, and what that does in, in turn, and uh, those of you that have been, you know Dr. Fairfax's work, her whole scholarship essentially for her whole career is basically built around looking at this, looking at how beavers, in her case, beavers act to create impoundments and then in turn, that, that, that entrainment or that capturing of things, most notably water, acts to facilitate more plants, more plants, more critters, more critters, more biodiversity, more biodiversity, better resistant to um, wildfires, for example. Okay, uh, so, so, the, so, those, so wet, our wetlands are gonna act to, um, in terms of water, recharge groundwater tables to take that water that might be evaporating up into the atmosphere or blasting on farther down um, to lower points of our system and allow it to, to you know, bloop, 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 go into the subsurface water table, for example. We call that recharge or groundwater recharge. Also, we can entrap the other substances as well. And so that's one of the reasons we talk about wetlands as being these sponges or being these um, uh, 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 kidneys or pollution um, sinks because they do have this ability to entrain, subs entrain materials. Um, also as a consequence of this, uh, they tend to be, um, at least our coastal systems, tend to be highly productive. And so having water, again, using Dr. Fairfax's beaver example, right, her, her beaver area, her area where water has been entrained and in, 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 um, restricted by the beavers, um, higher productivity um, because there's more water, there's more things for plants to grow. There's more critters there pooping in the water, all that stuff. Okay, um, 
Let's see, my thing is blocked here. How can I move this out of the way again? Okay, so wetland soils. Um, uh, these aren't the best pictures. I don't really have a lot of great pictures of this, so I, I lifted these pictures. Um, but, uh, sorry, let's find this. Uh, all my Zoom bars annoying and in the way most of the time. Um, anyway, okay, so so essentially what we've done here is we've we've taken a shovel and we've we've dug into the um, uh, wetland, and basically what we see is uh, and so the classic one would be, as particularly for us, would be like this image on the right. <clears throat> so these are both examples of um, soils that have been exposed to water for long periods of time. Um, so on the right, what's happened is the the minerals and the substances in the soil have um, essentially rusted in this case, right? So this iron is now very, uh, looks like the, um, let's say you had an iron gate at your house or something and it wasn't painted and, you know, it rained and after a while it went from being black to this sort of flaky orange. That's the same exact chemical process that's happening here on the right. And so, so, um, wetland soil experts can go in and knowing the conditions of the local um, uh, soils can go in and start digging and go, ah, this area has been exposed to water for a significant amount of time and it's transformed the substances and you can see the coloration differences in the soil. On the left, um, what you see is a classic thing for just about any wetland anywhere, which is um, our wetlands tend to be really, really good accumulators of dead stuff. Um, and more on this when we talk about our the biological context of wetlands, but suffice it to say that that dark blackness uh, there just subsurface is from all the organic material that is having a slow, a hard time degrading. So it's slowly degrading and so it's building up. So there's a high proportion of organic content of, of carbon in these soils relative to other soils in the area. So those are, th those are signals that we are indeed in a um, uh, 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 hydric soil setting. And then we have all of the uh, uh, inundation issues. For us in California, um, we uh, tend to, and especially in Southern California, we have pretty tweaked hydrology most of the time because we've done such a, such an intense job of manipulating our water flows and things of that nature. But, but obviously on the, on the far right, for example, we can see an example where, you know, in a river type context, yes, there's water there all the time. And so, um, and these pictures aren't actually from California, but they just, they, they do a better job of illustrating this. Um, so there's water all the time, right? So, so if we came there, um, it, uh, in uh, or at least most of the time it's not not a pure river but we're just on the edge of the river so for a good chunk of the time we would show up there it would be wet now in the middle would be a more transitional type context so during the say winter time of the year it would be wet all the time in this case this is, this is a swamp a wooded uh, wetland um, and during the rainy time of the year always wet Okay, cool. But if we came during the, the summertime, the dry time of the year, it would be dry. And then on the left, we see an example of a site that is um, uh, mostly dry for most of the year. So this would be a wetland setting where um, when we got some good rains, the water might uh, uh, pound up, right? M might, might build up, might, might become standing water for a certain period of time, but it would be relatively limited, you know, weeks, or so on end. So even if it was the, the rainy season, we might go there and it could be uh, dry or at least it would be muddy. At least there wouldn't be standing water on the surface. There might be water subsurface, but, um, but the legal definition is 14 days. So it has to be at least 14 days. The other aspect of the tripartite definition that, that doesn't really so much apply to us in California, um, with the possible exception of some of the areas up in the Sierras, et cetera, um, those 14 days have to be during the um, time when um, essentially life can use them, essentially the time when plants can take up that water and grow. For us, that's basically all time of the year. So 14 days of water is it. 
if we were in some other places, say like uh, Northern Canada, Alaska, places of this nature, it might be so super cold. We might get, um, you know, snow in this case, frozen precipitation. We might get that for a long period of time, but everything is in hibernation. Everything is in seed bank. Everything has died back. And so that, that um, several weeks, let's say, of being inundated might not matter because nothing can, uh, the biological context of the system can't utilize that water. Cool. And then uh, just, we won't talk about this, but, but you guys can, can go look it up if you want. But this is again, the notion of the type of, of plants, the wetland loving plants. And we mentioned that there's um, facultative plants and obligate plants. And what makes something one or the other? Um, obligate have to live in a wetland, facultative can live in a wetland, but other than that, it's, it's a variable list. It's gonna depend on the setting, it's gonna depend on the location, it's gonna depend on what the experts say. So there isn't a magical definition for, for, the, for, for um, uh, completely objectively saying whether this thing is a wetland plant or not. It's gonna be mediated by experts. And you can look at the classification systems and the, and the lists online if you're so interested. Okay, there we go. So let's talk a little bit more about the factors, the abiotic settings for our wetlands. Is that good so far? Questions? Questions about any of that? No, I put everybody to sleep. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, okay, so the abiotic factors that are going to produce our wetlands are going to be overall climate the geomorphological setting, and the hydrological regime. There's other stuff going on. The edaphic, meaning the soil properties, a lot of that has to do with the fungal communities and the, and the microbial communities. The particular vegetation, how we're disturbing that vegetation, et cetera. But those things in parentheses are more, uh, I'm gonna pause on that, that's more for stuff in the biotic aspect of the wetlands. Um, so we're just talking about the first three uh, initially here. So it's the climate, the geomorphological setting, the hydrological regime that's going to tell us if we can have a wetland and if we can't have wetland, the general type of wetland we might have. Um, what our society has done is our society has added additional stuff. In addition to the, the purely abiotic, the purely biotic, we've, we've added a whole host of stressors that we'll spend we'll essentially be talking about as we go on for the rest of the semester and talk about restoration and how we try to minimize those stressors. But all that stuff together comes together to produce a wetland. So climate, what do I mean by climate? I mean the balance, the dynamic balance here. So um, there is a, um, there's a water component where we're adding water and there's a water component where we're taking that water away. Now, again, this is all outside of people, right? So this is just the natural setting. If no humans were alive on the planet, this would still be going on. And so there's gonna be some balance and that balance is gonna vary depending on where we are on the planet, where we are latitudinally, and also where we are with regards to um, some of the local, local geography. Are we behind a mountain range? Are we in front of a mountain range? Things of that nature. So if we're in a desert, the type of wetland we might possibly get is going to be quite different than if we're in a tropical rainforest. And uh, so I'll just say that. So, so there, there's a climactic component here. And so that means that as we're experiencing now our changing climate, thanks to the, the climate change and the climate crisis, um, the types of wetlands that might um, be theoretically possible in a given area are changing. It's no question. This is actually already happening. The question is how much are, are they going to be changing? How quickly are they going to be changing? And is it going to be, you know, sort of a, a different type of apple or is it a completely different type of fruit that we're going to have, that we're going to have uh, to deal with in our, in our palate. And, and that last question as to, is it just a, a modification of the existing type? Or is it gonna be a wholesale transformation of a completely different category of wetland or different classification of wetland? That's an area of active research and we, we, don't, we don't know yet. Um, clearly, as we go uh, farther in time away from now, the, the smaller differences are gonna increase and increase and increase. And at some point, 
it's absolutely going to happen that some of those wetland types aren't just going to become a different flavor. They're going to become a wholesale different type of wetland and indeed may well cease to be able to support wetland communities in that particular area because of the climate. Okay, the next thing would be the, the geomorphic or geomorphological setting. And that's just the physical setting, the shape of the, of the contours of the landscape. And so this is going to essentially uh, be dictated, are we next to a river? Are we next to an ocean? Are we in a local low spot, et cetera? And so just this little teeny definition, or little, excuse me, little teeny um, diagram here of a, of a fen, actually, um, is just, you know, the little quick cartoon representation of that. So, so the shape of the area is going to define for us the possibility of a wetland, right? All of this abiotic stuff is telling us the possibilities of a wetland. Um, they're not complete, but if we don't have those possibilities, we can't go forward in, in crafting our wetland community. And so there's, there, you know, stuff we can see very easily on the surface, stuff we can't see very easily uh, uh, subsurface, and how the materials and the water in particular come in and, and go out of the system. That's all the geomorpho ge geomorphic setting or geomorphological setting. Uh, next would be the, the hydrological regime. So uh, first and foremost, how much water, but then um, uh, equally as important, if not more important, is the timing of that water. So in some cases, we can have um, a, a, permanent a permanent amount of input of water. Say if we're underneath a dam or on the side of a river that is a year round flowing river, right? Um, that might be close to a consistent level of, of water. Um, then uh, the more interesting ones I would suggest are the ones where we have much more variation in the system excuse me, much more variation in the, in the water. And so two broad types of that we have, um, and that have to do with time scales. One is short term, one is long term. So the short term would be something like our, our seasonal salt marshes that we'll spend time talking about. Um, and so here it's the ocean tides that are going up and down that are leading to a daily or hourly variation in, in how much water is available. So this, this plant might be in the air for at, at 9.30 right now. And then at, uh, I don't know, 10.30, 11.30, it might be underwater, it might be submerged. Um, so that's gonna be uh, typically a tidal type of system. The other would be a seasonal system. So this would be something more like that, um, the video I just showed, the, the key factors, um, where it is uh, during the wet time of the year, it is, it is uh, has standing water, et cetera. During the dry time of the year, it is uh, uh, not wet at all, or, or the, the plants are not submerged at all, for example. Um, and then we can also talk about what is the water source. And this can have implications for the, particularly the types of uh, vegetation that can live there. Um, rainfall is obviously one major, major source of, um, or, or recent rainfall, I should say, direct rainfall is one source of um, water for our wetlands. The next would be um, uh, next to a, and I should say, generally speaking, um, we see uh, systems that precipitation is important, generally have low throughput. So generally the precipitation is a system that's going to entrain, uh, a precipitation driven wetland is one that's going to act to hold that water, particularly in places like California where we tend to be dry. Uh, uh, then we can have sources of water from um, a consistent year-round uh, flowing water source like a river. And those areas tend to be, um, uh, have much more permeability. And because the water source is more predictable, those systems are less um, dependent on entrainment and capturing and, uh, and, and, and hermetically sealing the bottom, as it were, and so water can more easily flow in and flow out, generally speaking, for riverine systems. Uh, uh, similar to that, we have groundwater systems. So groundwater um, would be, uh, we most typically see this in areas where the groundwater is very, very close to the surface, and we just puncture the surface, say like a, a divot in the surface, or more typically, where we have a hillside, and this is more common for us here 
in, in our uh, Southern California with our coastal um, mountains and things, but where we have a, a hillside and there's been some uh, uh, stress or break to the underlying geology. And so we create a crack that could be either um, a, an earthquake or a, or a, a fault of a, a erosion or a catastrophic failure of some different um, soil systems and, and uh, uh, rock profiles. Or it could be something as simple as uh, a big giant tree was there and then in a storm that tree blew over but that the root ball ripped up and created a depression there. In any event, that you can get the situation where the groundwater which was flowing subsurface because of this discontinuity, now the water can actually percolate up and, and get into the, the, the upper reaches. And so we can have a groundwater fed uh, wetland. And then uh, one that's increasingly important is our uh, uh, human um, cause, our, our, our human fed systems. And so the classic thing here would be urban drool, what we call urban drool, which is um, the areas near uh, a, a large urban center or even suburban center, um, because we do so much watering of our uh, uh, lawns, because we do so much, um, uh, you know, car washing and all the stuff we do, that, that those waters go onto our impermeable surfaces, our concretes, our asphalt systems, et cetera. And then they go into some type of storm drain system, the storm drain system, blah, 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 blah. And so, in fact, I've been, I had an interesting conversation a couple of years ago with a, a planner from Thousand Oaks. And one of the things we're trying to do now, well, I should be careful of this because this is going to get into some future conversations we're going to have. But long, long story short, um, uh, the water um, from these urban drool systems from this runoff historically has caused a lot of problems and it's caused a lot of um, taking of oils and other toxins and things into our stormwater system and into our coastal streams, et cetera. So there's been a, there was a big push. There has been a big push over the last 20 years to deal with that so-called non-point source um, um, pollution and, and uh, all of that. Uh, this will play out when we talk about uh, Malibu Lagoon. Again, this, this is a big part of the initial story in, in the controversy there. But um, so as a consequence, we're, we're pe planners and, and responsible parties are saying, hey, we, we shouldn't let all this urban drool just go flowing out. It's got plastic bags in it. It's got oil from people's cars, all this kind of stuff. So we've created networks of treatment wetlands or um, so-called bioswales that are depressions that, that are manufactured wetlands in a sense, in effect, um, around our urban areas. Um, and initially there were a few. Now in many building codes around California and the US, people are required to do these. So it's not about creating a big treatment wetland to handle the water flowing out of Thousand Oaks per se, or Camarillo per se, or Ventura per se. It's more about the development, the, the housing development, the hospital, the, the um, uh, mall having these little bioswales in their areas. So it's a, it, it's a million little teeny tiny bioswales that will help intercept that water. Uh, and so in actually talking with um, a planner in Thousand Oaks during our last big drought, he thought that, we've, that the city of Thousand Oaks has done such a good job of requiring these bioswales that he thinks we might actually have no urban drool in the near future coming off of impervious surface, and I should say no net urban drool coming off surfaces in the city of Thousand Oaks and going into our coastal uh, watersheds. Um, interesting idea, not sure if that's actually gonna happen, but the point being that, that many uh, systems have grown up now over the decades and centuries on the edges of human impervious surfaces. And so some wetland systems have become dependent on those the, that, that urban drool setting, that, that artificial um, hydrologic regime. Um, and then here's just a, a, a diagram of, you know, just again, a little bit of this notion of, of the setting in the context of the setting, right? So here we're talking about a relatively on top, a relatively undisturbed uh, setting. So we have a forested uh, valley, let's say, we have a river in the middle. 
we have a natural uh, levee on the side of the river that's not human caused, but that's just part of how rivers evolved. You guys should take our water resources management class if you're interested in that. Um, and, uh, and, and then we have some, so then between the river and the, the forest, we have this wetland setting. In this case, it's, di it's illustrated as a swamp, but it doesn't have to be a swamp. It could be a, a marsh, it could be whatever. Um, but then as we do things like um, disturb the um, uh, uh, vegetation community on the hillside, we can radically change the um, water situation. And particularly if we also draw down or, or pump out that groundwater table, we can radically change the situation and in effect kill the wetland or make the wetland in the context of today's lecture, the abiotic uh, context, make it not possible to support a wetland there. Or at least not possible without massive intervention and, and high um, uh, continuous input of water artificially. Um, another example of altered uh, regimes and, and, and hydrology, um, probably the, the, the greatest tragedy in the US, at least when it comes to wetland, is what we've done to the state of Florida. So this really was a magic place. Um, and uh, it, the Everglades have been referred to as the sea of grass. And that's, you know, that, that's a sort of poetic description, but it really is, really was true. We have this, you know, hundreds of miles wide river, essentially extremely shallow, extremely slow flowing river during the wet times of the year, basically. And what was going on here was this water, this, this fresh water source here, Lake Okeechobee would overflow its banks basically and flow southward and flow down towards the Keys, towards the southern tip of Florida um, through this, this series of marshlands primarily. Uh, and we don't like that because that's nature. And so we've decided there's much better uses for that. So uh, Disney World and uh, Miami and uh, growing citrus, all these things are much more important. So what the Army Corps of Engineers began, uh, century or so ago was a massive replumbing and repiping of the Everglades. And so again, we had some of this in the, when we talked about the rhetoric of wetlands and, and the conceptualization of wetland, wetlands. But remember I showed the, the funeral pyre, the burning of bodies and, and the dangerous threatening wetland, all that kind of stuff, that, that was the story here. And so um, what we've done is we've essentially sucked all that water out of the river of grass and have, now we have very little river of grass remaining. And so instead, we've, we've um, pushed the water into human dominated systems. And what we like to do in our human dominated systems is we like to tell the water what to do. So one, we like to have the water go to a certain place very fast. And we like to have that water leave that place very fast. So um, it's leading to all kinds of things, but uh, houses falling just in the middle of the day, just having lunch, all of a sudden, people's houses fall in as these sinkhole, massive sinkholes erupt um, because we've dewatered the system. We have huge problems with um, seawater uh, uh, encroachment into the subsurface water table. So in this setting, not only was this water going out and feeding the wetlands, it was also feeding the, the groundwater table. And so if, you know, back in the day, if you were say, in this part of the Florida coast or in this part of the Florida coast and you wanted some, even though you're relatively close to the ocean, you wanted some water, you could just sink a well. And there's so much hydrologic head, how much, so much hydrologic pressure here shoving this fresh water out, even though people were very close to the ocean, they could drink fresh water no problem and relatively clean fresh water at that. Um, what we've done is not only have we screwed the wetlands over, we've also screwed the water sources over. So now mo many, many of these wells in these coastal zones are now salty. So the wells may well exist, still exist, but if you pump them, you try to drink them, it, it wouldn't be drinkable or you'd have to treat it first before you could drink it. Um, so, so our manipulation of these systems is, is a problem. And while we can manipulate them in a lot of ways, the most conspicuous one is when we manipulate the abiotic aspects of the wetland, in particular, the hydrological settings of these wetlands. Uh, some common wetland types. Again, uh, marsh refers to 
wetlands that are dominated by herbaceous things. This would be herbaceous, meaning non-woody plants. So grasses, um, things with broad leaves, flowers, those kinds of things. Versus a swamp. A swamp is something that has woody tissue. So shrubs, trees, things of that nature. And so these are just some of the, um, I think the most uh, uh, common types of wetlands in, in, our, in our conceptualization of wetlands. Um, the, the grade ones we don't have here in California. So I've, I've, I've made those um, uh, gray. So the ones that we really have around, and we don't really have that many bogs or fens, we have a few, but, but uh, uh, basically for us, if we say Southern California here, coastal Southern California, we're talking salt marshes. We do have some depressional wetlands here and there. Um, we have riparian corridors. So wetlands along the edges of rivers or just outside the, the edge of a river. Um, vernal pools. These are a, a particular type of seasonal wetland that are quite important in our, in our coastal terraces. Um, the, the vernal pools exist all, all over. They're not just a coastal system, but, but they're particularly important for us um, for a variety of reasons, including the fact that they support a large number of um, endangered species that are highly dependent on those systems. And then another really important one for us is this whole notion of, of artificial wetlands or constructed wetlands. So we already talked about things like the bioswales that we might put for water treatment around our, our urban areas, but we also create uh, wetlands for um, uh, treat other, other, other management purposes, things like bioremediation, trying to take out um, a, a to or, or lower a potentially a toxic substance. And so we see those around our treatment plants. So a lot of our treatment plants utilize um, constructed uh, a treatment, so-called treatment wetlands to deal with say high nutrients or something of that nature. And then we have some settings, not so much here in Southern California, but if we go up into Northern California, Central California, et cetera, the Central Valley, we'll see a lot of, of artificial agriculture um, uh, settings. We actually do have some of these actually here as well. Why am I saying Ashley so much today? I don't, what's going on with my language? Um, but we do have some of these um, settings that are managed just like rice paddies, just like agricultural fields, but they're managed for waterfowl, for hunting, for game. And so these are just outside of Magoo Lagoon. And we'll talk about those when we get to talking about uh, Magoo Lagoon and, and the wetland restoration and the story of Magoo. Um, but so, so for us, I would say the, the, the most interesting ones are, and most important ones are, are depressional, little isolated, like, like that video I showed at the start, little depressional wetlands, um, fresh water, uh, salt marsh wetlands, riparian, wetlands along our riparian corridors, um, vernal pools. Um, vernal pools and the artificial ones are relatively small numerically, but those two are, are, are important conceptually, I would say, for our California setting. Um, okay, so we're almost to our break. Uh, so then uh, I'll just end the, this abiotic discussion here with noting, um, as we said before, but we obviously have clear impacts on the, the geomorphological setting when we, when we do grading and things of that nature or filling in particular, or simply messing with the hydrology. And so uh, groundwater pumping, sometimes surface water pumping, although that, that really doesn't so much happen here in California. Um, but, but groundwater, messing with groundwater in particular, first and foremost for agriculture is by far our biggest consumer of water and util user of water in California. Um, uh, industry, so uh, needing um, to have pure water, let's say, for, for um, computer circuit manufacturing and things of that nature. Uh, and then, of course, just for drinking, just for us to have something to consume. Um, uh, fragmenting habitat. So we had a contiguous wetland, we put a road through it, we, we broke that. That also has implications for how water flows through the system. Um, and, then, and then while this doesn't so much happen anymore, it still does happen, unfortunately, but this was really a much bigger part of the story um, historically, last many decades in California, that would be draining and filling of wetlands. But we do have situations, one of the one of the, uh, oh, I was going to put a picture in here. I didn't. One of the, what's the term I use? Gentlemen that uh, uh, some of the agencies that I've worked with have sparred with over, so I have to be careful here because there's legal action and stuff that might still be going on. But um, uh, 
there are people that are actively still screwing up wetlands to essentially just give a middle finger to wetland systems functioning ecology. No good reason, serves no purpose. There's no, there's no emergency need, there's nothing of that nature, but it is um, just wanting to have more land to do whatever with. And so draining and filling still goes on, unfortunately. Um, and then we have the, the notion of damming and flooding. So damming, um, basically interrupting the flow of water, generally speaking, meaning to reduce the amount of water, flooding meaning to, to put way more water in the system than it historically could handle. So flooding can actually take a wetland and destroy it. We, in water parts, California, this might seem like a weird thing, but actually we can flood an area so much it ceases to become a wetland and it becomes say a lake or a reservoir. Uh, and then in some cases we have diversion channels to deal with particular ag situations and things of that nature. So I think that's, that was my, yeah. So that's my just quick and dirty intro to the abiotic aspect of wetlands. We next need to talk about the biological or the biotic setting of wetlands. Um, and we're, so we're just, we're about, nine minutes before or so our break. So um, I think I'll just pause here and ask, does anybody have any questions about that general introduction to abiotic setting? So climate, uh, shape of the ground, geomorphology, and water supply are the, are the key abiotic uh, settings for a wetland. Questions about that? What was the last type of wetland that you mentioned? Uh, uh, this one right here, artificial or constructed? Yeah. Yeah. So that's just, I mean, that's, that's a bit maybe of a lame term for me to use because, you know, we could do a restoration and we could, you know, restore a riparian forest or we could restore a salt marsh. So I suppose some people could say that's a constructed marsh. But um, what I mean by this one is, is, is um, um, an action by a person or a system that's created to have elements of a wetland but not necessarily trying to replicate entirely a natural uh, system. So for example, the, the bioremediation wetlands, the best ones, the ones that I like, the ones that, um, at uh, the Ormond Beach Wastewater Treatment Facility for, or not Ormond Beach, the Ormond, <laughs> the Ormond uh, Wastewater Treatment Facility, awesome model, fantastic place. Um, they've made their treatment wetlands like a natural wetland. So if we go there and you look at it, you're like, oh, this is cool you might not know that it is serving a, a, um, a management purpose, right? Or, or a water quality purpose, because they've done it so well. Um, and that absolutely, that, that, that's the ideal. If we can do that, that's great. But in other cases, we don't have the time or the space or maybe the climate. Maybe this is in Phoenix, Arizona. We can't make a wetland, but we can make a treatment wetland. Those are, are uh, can be in things like, um, uh, artificial ponds, right? They can be in tanks. In some cases, they can be in tanks or raceways even, right? And so we might have wetland plants. There might be some wetland, um, you know, some birds might be able to use the plants or something of that nature, but, but maybe bobcats can't get in there or coyotes can't get in there because it's a, in, behind a chain link fence or something of that nature. So, so, um, uh, and, and then, and then the example of, the um, rice paddies, right, or the or the artificial constructed um, agricultural wetland. So we, that would be an area where we flood it so that the the rice plants can have their water. But uh, and so again, migratory waterfowl ducks migrating through can land and maybe eat some of the plants and rest and eat some of the insects in the area. So they they absolutely we absolutely can be see some benefit from this system, but um, the farmer controls all the water, right? It's not, it's not a, it's not a groundwater fed thing or a rainfall fed thing, let's say. Um, they might have other artificial structures on there. And so, so what I mean by artificial and constructed, it's really something that's not trying to be a quote unquote natural system. It's just trying to replicate certain elements of it. Um, does that make sense? Yes. Okay, cool. Thank you. Other questions, other questions about, um, the abiotic, uh, wetlands or abiotic factors in wetland determination. So an example of the, uh, <clears throat> like a constructed wetland, 
you could say like the Ventura wastewater treatment plants over yes. in the harbor? Yes. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. So, so, so um, Ventura's uh, uh, wastewater treatment facility is, I would say, a constructed wet. What well, is a construction constructed wetland? But in this context, yes, they're not. They're not. They're not trying to make it a salt marsh. They're not trying to make it a bog or whatever, right? They're just trying to optimize it. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? They're trying to optimize it for their management need, which is to clean the water, to polish the water. Yeah. And so, uh, so that would be an example. Let's see. Other examples would be um, uh, other examples nearby. I'm trying to think of a nearby example. Well, we have our our, our canyon water treatment uh, yeah. facility for City of Thousand. Sorry, question. No. Anyway, so no, go ahead. I was going to bring up the Oxnard one as well. Mm -hmm. Artificial um, wetlands that they built around the Oxnard water treatment plant. Yeah, totally. And so, uh, and so that those are absolutely those are constructed. Um, although, again, I would say those are those are those are designed. They 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 need to serve their engineering purpose, their their water cleaning purpose. Absolutely. So they're constructed, but they've they've tried to make them as, as natural and as, um, and as, uh, uh, as ecologically functioning as possible, right? Um, uh, other systems uh, would be, yeah, I can't, I'm trying to think, I don't know why I'm having a blank here. So for example, in, in Camarillo Regional Park, we have the, um, for the water district, we have these retention basins, right? Those aren't actually wetlands because they're retention basins. They're not sometimes wet and sometimes not wet. They're, they're always wet. So they're essentially a pond. They're, they're, they're not a wetland. But that would be an example of something that's you know, constructed. And that's, that's there to hold the water. That is it. It's not trying to do some other function. It's just trying to act as a storage facility for the water. Um, other examples are um, actually well, oh, an example I was trying to build and a great one. I would still love to have it, but I lose these arguments most of the time. So before I came down to um, Channel Islands, one of my things I was doing up in the Bay Area before I came down is I was um, a consultant on, at this museum called the Tech Museum. Have any guys been to the Tech Museum or heard of the Tech Museum? It's in San Jose, California. No. no. Excellent. Great. So, <laughs> so it's, it's a cool museum. It's in Silicon Valley, right? So it's like, it's called the tech and it's about, you know, technology and it's in mostly what they, they fall into the trap of, of technology is high technology, right? Technology is my computer right here. Technology is my, um, my, my iPhone and you know, all that kind of stuff, which makes sense because they're in Silicon Valley. Um, but they decided in the, in the uh, early 2000s that, um, hey, we want to do some other examples of technology. And they wanted to talk about green technology, so, so sustainable technologies. So I was the consultant with them and I helped them design a bunch of exhibits and build some things and stuff. And it was really cool, it was a temporary exhibit, unfortunately. So I don't think it exists anymore. But, um, but one of the things we did was, uh, and this will take us to the break, I guess. One of the things we did was, um, we want, I wanted, we want to talk about treatment wetlands, we want to talk about constructed wetlands, but this is in a, an area, it's actually was in the building where, um, wait, was it in the building or I just parked in the building where Adobe was? So I think I just, no, I think I just parked in the building where Adobe was, but it was across the street, the, the actual museum. Anywho, so we go there and um, or I'm trying to figure out how, and it's, it's an indoor museum, it's, it's a skyscraper type of building, right? It's a, it's a big multi-story, in the middle of an urban town, like, well, how can we do this? There wasn't a park next to it or anything. They didn't own any parkland. So we got the idea. What we'd do is we'd go to the roof and we'd make um, a treatment wetland for, uh, for the visitors. So we put a outhouse on the roof, right? And so people could, uh, you know, relieve themselves and that human waste, liquid and solid waste would go into this treatment wetland. And so it was a series of, uh, of uh, um, it's, it's a longer conversation, but basically um, we, through a series of, of tanks and things, we treated the, the waste just like we would a mini version of what we do in a, 
in an urban treatment plant, right, or a, a, a regular old treatment plant. Um, so we treated the waste, so it was basically clean. It was almost all the way clean. It wasn't technically drinkable, but it was very, very close to that stage. But then for the final, final part of that, we created what's called a polishing wetland or a finishing wetland. And so we took that wastewater and we put it into this um, uh, uh, raceway that was planted with all kinds of wetland plants. We had fish, we had all this kind of cool stuff. And what I wanted to do, right, because I'm so nerdy, what I wanted to do is I wanted it to go to a, a, a tap at the end of the thing so you could drink it. Um, and so you could go take a leak in that, in the, in the, in the um, uh, outhouse, and then you come to the end and you could actually drink your water. Long story short, the, the law lawyers didn't want us to do that. And they said, well, that would be bad. And, uh, and there's all these public health things we had to do and stuff. So, so we actually never consumed our water. We had to just take the water and put it into the, the, the drain, basically, and send it to the sewer. But, but, um, but that, that would be an example of a classically artificial wetland, right? So you can have a wetland on the roof of a skyscraper. And there's no reason why other people couldn't do this. We couldn't do this right now in San Francisco and LA or whatever. People could have a cool little... Um, a, a piece of nature, right? So all the aesthetics, people go have lunch up there, chill out, have trees, plants, and that could be cleaning the water of the building or the residents of the building um, and all that. That would be an example of a, of a constructed wetland or a treatment wetland. Um, anyway, la last bit was when I came down here, you know, just starting campus, brand new campus, I was all much younger and much more energetic, right? And I was like, let's do a treatment wetland on campus. Let's, do, let's have it such that, and this would be a great idea for you guys to push. Um, what if we said we didn't produce any wastewater from CSUCI? What if we just produced potable water? That was the only thing that came out of campus. Totally, totally logistically feasible. Very simple. Now, this has been done in many places. Um, and so what I wanted to do is I wanted to do that like I did in the, in the, um, uh, in the museum, larger scale, obviously, but then have, then have the water, the, pit, the, the, the treatment wetland be the central mall. So right now we have the lawn, right? We have the, the pepper trees. We have the lawn that comes down from, um, from Broom Library and goes down towards the science building, towards Aliso Hall. I was like, man, let's just have this be the treatment wetland. So we keep the trees, we just have a, a treatment wetland and we have a couple bridges over it so everybody whether they're an ESRM major, chemistry major, art major, social major, business major, whatever, everybody, when they're going back and forth to class, they're walking over this example of sustainability. They're walking over this example of healthy, well-functioning ecosystems. And it both is serving a, a practical purpose. We're reducing our environmental impact. We're providing more potable water. And it's also reinforcing this <clears throat> in terms of a daily basis. And long story short, the answer was no, you can't do that because. Uh, of a variety of reasons. You guys can think about it over the break. And if you want, we can, we can talk about it for a minute or two before we start our next section. But um, I've talked us up to the break. Any other questions about the abiotic settings of wetlands? Okay, 10 minute break. Everybody get up, stretch, eat your power bar, and I'll pick us up in 10 minutes. I'm gonna pause the recording. Uh, pick it up here. Uh, I just um, put in the a chat a link. Uh, I thought I'd mentioned this before, but just in case I didn't, um, I'm doing a, a panel with some folks from different areas in the Western U.S. Uh, tonight at this uh, this uh, Unitarian Church in um, Thousand Oaks has these has these topical um, community fora, and so. Uh, it's not a religious thing, but they just they just put it on at the church. And um, tonight we're talking about public lands, protected areas, and things, and the current um, current institutional assault on national parks and monuments and things of that nature. So um, you're welcome to come. It's it's an evening thing tonight. It's it's obviously on Zoom, but I just put the link in the um, chat because uh, I would encourage you guys, even if you don't want to come hear me talk or whatever, and I can totally understand why that is. But um, if you register, you get a free link to watch the Patagonia film, 
which is awesome. It's an hour and a half documentary that they produced about um, threats to public land, um, uh, the sort of history of that and what's going on now in different parts, Alaska, the Intermountain West. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty cool thing. It's not, doesn't directly necessarily relate to restoration, but it definitely, I think would be of interest to most of you guys that have an environmental interest. Again, you can, anybody's eligible, you could be in Australia, whatever, but to see the, to get a link for the movie, you have to register for the event. You can just register and not come to the event if you didn't want to and just wanted to watch the movie, but it is really cool and it's, uh, it's a great movie. Otherwise, it's hard to see because it, it uh, you do, it's not a free thing. Um, you have to go to an event like this to see it. So it's in the link, the, the link question. there is to the, Doug, somebody had a question? No, just a comment that I've had a, um, I've not been able to get, even with the link, I have not been able to get to view the motion picture. Um, for some reason, it will not connect. So I sent a message to one of the people at okay. the um, palace, and they sent me back a message that said it sometimes takes a long time to load up or something, but it never did. And I tried it three different times already and okay. have not been able to see it. So I don't know if there's anything you can do about that, but. I'll ask. I mean, so uh, I know you guys would find this shocking, but I had a hard time watching it. Not because it, was, it wasn't a great movie, but just because I didn't have enough time because <laughs> I'm bumping from crisis to crisis. So I uh, watched some of it on my phone when I was running. When I first tried to load it up on my phone, it, it did, it like, it looked like it was broken or something. Like, what the heck? Why is this not, even when, even when I started on Wi-Fi at my house, it was not loading. So it took a while. And then after it, it got through that buffering process, then it actually worked. But, um, okay. but I, I watched, I watched um, most of it on my computer. Um, and that well, on Wi-Fi, and that was good. I'm sure it, you know, it worked. It worked on my cell phone network, but it was just a lot slower. But okay, that's yeah, a great I thing. I think I'll try it on my cell phone then. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you can also just try re-registering or something. Maybe they'll send a different link or or whatever. But uh, okay. again, that's not required. Just if people are interested, you guys can check it out. You have to watch it before five o'clock or something today. Could be. Yeah. I, I mean, our, well, our our forum is at seven, so I. Right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, no worries. All right, let's get back. So uh, the plan then is I'm going to talk about uh, biological stuff and then want to turn back and, and keep talking about our progress on our field of dreams um, data verse. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to talk about the, the concepts. So I have uh, concepts going on here and then I have uh, some... Um, Actually, let's do this. Let's, sorry, let me do this. Give me one second. Let me stop this.